Good evening, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we're going to continue with our work on uh, snow loading. In this case, working through a long form example, a long form numerical example of a uh, sort of flat roof building with two elevations, just looking at how to calculate flat roof, uh, flat roof snow loading, as well as uh, applying the equations from ASC 7, the equations and provisions of uh, drift calculations. So I am going to just go ahead and write out the problem, give and find, uh, given and find, all the details, and then we'll begin to work through it. All right, so let's begin. So we're going to have a building, and it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be located in Portland, Oregon. So we have a building in Portland, Oregon. Um, let's see, and it's being built at an elevation of 25 feet. Of 25 feet. That means 25 feet above sea level, and it has the following properties. So let me draw out a simple schematic of the building. So we have this kind of two-tiered design, um, something kind of like this. Completely not to scale, but that's okay. We're just doing some calculations. Let's get that there. We're going to be five feet for this uh, for this upper portion. Fifteen feet. Um, in the first vertical area, or first vertical dimension. Then this dimension is going to be 60 feet, and this dimension is going to be uh, 80 feet. So what we have is a two-tiered building. We have a building that is um, approxim well, actually, approximately 140 feet long altogether. One section of it has a total height of 20 feet, and one section of it has a total height of 15 feet. And uh, we will use another number later on. The dimension into the page is going to be 100 feet. So it's a squarish building with two different uh, levels. Um, so there's that. Um, and in terms of what this building is going to be used for, that's going to be important as well. And in case it's, so in case that's not clear, this is go this as shown here is an elevation view. So we are looking at this from the side. And so it so this bottom section, the, the, the section that spans across the entire um, length is going to, or the entire width, whatever you want to call it, is 15 feet tall. And then there's this additional section that is 80 feet, that is five feet, raised five feet above it. Or another way to think of this is you have a building that has a uh, a total height of 80, or sorry, of 20 feet, but uh, 60 feet of it has a cutout elevation. So maybe this is a high bay or some high storage facility or something like that. Now, um, this, we're going to have a little fun with this. I just I was racking my brain trying to think about, think about what this building would be used for, and I decided to just uh, have a little fun with it. This building is being used for the storage of weapons-grade plutonium. Bet you didn't see that coming. Well, some of my former students probably did, but... So, <laughs> this is being used to store weapons-grade plutonium in... <laughs> And it's in the middle of Portland for some reason. And it's uh, also, the site is, uh, so it's just in the middle of Portland. So we're not in an empty field somewhere. We are surrounded by buildings. And where exactly in Portland doesn't matter, um, but we'll just say there are many surrounding buildings. Uh, at the site we're constructing this. I could have just said it was a fire station or something, but that's that's boring. Let's make it a plutonium storage facility instead. Oh, also, because it's immediately surrounded by other buildings, this building has to be in flagrant violation of NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, regulations and all sorts of federal laws. But we may be violating all sorts of radiation protection laws, but we will be uh, following the ASCE 7 provisions uh, as best we can. So... <laughs> Anyway, that's a little fun. Um, okay, so let's see. It's very close to my other structures. 
and also it can be assumed has uh, to have a, a rough it has a rough flat roof in truth there would be some slight slope to it but i'm going to say it's so um it's flat enough that we can just regard it as a zero angle roof so we have our incredibly uh, incredibly illegal plutonium storage facility probably located in downtown portland or something and so uh and that's what we're going to be and we're going to be working with the uh snow loads on this and what we're going to find let's find um one, we want the uniform live load, or not uniform live load, the uniform snow load that will apply across the entire roof. Uh, the uniform snow load. And two, a uh, drift load, if any. So this video is building directly on um, the material from the previous two videos. Uh, the first given, the first find basically relates to the a video two videos ago where we looked at the basic snow load provisions. That video is titled Introduction to Snow Load, and the drift load uh, calculations are laid out in the previous video in this playlist. Uh, so drift snow load, if any. And we'll go ahead and calculate those. Okay, so we have everything we should need, and again, as a reminder, this 100 foot uh, distance, that's just sort of the dimension of this thing into the page. What really matters for most of our work is going to be just the elevation dimensions. It is 15 feet high and 60 feet wide in the lower portion and 20 feet high and 80 feet long in the tall portion of the building. And that should be all we need. And now let's begin to work through the calculations. All right, with the problem defined, let's go ahead and begin our work in designing this horribly illegal facility. Okay, so I'm going to write out every step, um, write them out as a series of discrete steps. If you were doing this by hand, you probably wouldn't need to put quite as much documentation. And especially if you were doing this via a uh, computer calculation, a lot of these steps could be combined together. But I want to uh, thoroughly go through and label everything, just so it's very clear what I'm doing when, because this is meant for instructional purposes. Okay, so my first step is going to be determine the risk category. Uh, determine the risk category. And this can be found in the uh, the video on the importance factor and the risk categories. Uh, so risk category. And uh, this is found in table, and I'm, I'm going to not say ASC 716 all the way through. All of the references I use in this video are going to just be ASC 716. Minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. So uh, when I say uh, table 1.5-1, uh, that refers to ASC 7. Um, so 1.5-1 to get the uh, appropriate risk category. And most of the things in, the risk in, in uh, this risk category that we need to look at are um, things like police and fire stations. But uh, another, as we discussed in that video, another thing that is included in that category uh, 4 are things that pose a great danger to the uh, surrounding community and absolutely positively need to be made need to be kept inside and i'm pretty sure i'm no expert on this but i'm pretty sure weapons grade plutonium qualifies again for some reason we are ignoring every nuclear uh, law out there and storing <laughs> flagrantly storing weapons grade plutonium in say downtown portland um but uh for some reason we, we're doing that we don't mind doing that but for some reason we want to make sure our building is designed according to proper ASC provisions. <laughs> okay, so there's that. So we are definitely category four. There is no question on this. We are storing plutonium. It is hard to get more dangerous than that. All right, so we have our uh, risk category. Now let's go and get our uh, snow importance factor. So step two is to determine the uh, snow importance factor. Uh, the snow importance factor. And this is going to be found in table 1.5-2. And the variable for this is IS. It's the variable used in ASC 7. And we uh, we should not be surprised that due to the uh, terrifying nature of the things stored in this building, our importance factor is the maximum value at 1.2. Okay, so we have that. Um, and then the third step is going to be to determine the ground level 
uh, snow load. In other words, the PG, so our third step, will be to determine the ground level snow load. Uh, determine. And this is just the, if you have, what again, what this essentially is, is if you just have a flat open field without any buildings nearby, what will be the expected 2% uh, annual return uh, load, uh, snow load, uh, in terms of PSF on the ground, um, just on the naked ground there. Okay, so determine uh, ground level snow load, and this is uh, P sub G. And to find this, I will look in, um, I will first look in the general figure uh, 7.2-1, which, which is a map that covers the entire United States. Uh, let's see, it's, it's 7.2-1. And I will, and that cover, that's a basically a topographic or a sort of a boundary map of the entire United States showing the expected snow loads in various locations. However, many states that have, especially ones that have very wildly varying um, and closely varying, I should say, not just wildly, but closely varying um, changes in elevation and climate and such, those will have uh, different snow, th those, have a, those are not just plotted on the map. They have separate tables that call out specific counties and cities. Um, within each state. And Oregon, where Portland is located, happens to be one of those. So we're going to go to the table representing Oregon, which is table 7.2-7. And from there we see a col uh, we see one column that shows the location and also the county, but that's Multnomah, I'll just leave that off. Um, and then it shows the PG in the next column. And the value for our uh, for our location that we're looking at is 11 uh, pounds per square foot, so 11 pounds per foot squared. And it also has a reference elevation. It has a reference elevation, and that reference elevation included in that table is 30 feet. So we have our PG value. We got that. that our PG is 11 pounds per square foot, or 11 PSF. Um, now, we do need to do one other thing with this step. We need to check to make sure our elevation is less than the reference elevation. Because if you think about snow, if you know anything, if, I mean, you can think about this just in terms of, even if you know nothing about snowy weather and never lived in a snowy location, think about Mount Everest or think about any tall mountain. Uh, mountains are known for having very um, high snow caps and things like that. And that's because as a general rule, it's not, I'm sure there's some weird exceptions out there, the earth has all sorts of topography and weather and, and climate and such, but as a general rule across the earth, the higher you go in elevation, the more snow you're gonna get. And that's, a, that's from a combination of factors. One, the higher elevation allows the land to catch more um, moisture from the, water, from the air as, as uh, clouds are passing over the land. Also, higher elevations, uh, you have different air pressures that causes that, and also higher elevations tend to be cooler, which also will cause uh, precipitation to, to drop out. So, as a general rule, the higher you go in elevation, the, uh, the, uh, the higher the snowfall. So, because higher elevations have higher snowfalls, as long as we're somewhere under the reference elevation, we can use this value without searching any other references. And uh, if the, uh, so, for example, here, in this problem, we were at an elevation of 25 feet. That was provided. So our elevation is 25 feet, which is in fact less than the reference elevation of 30 feet. So we'll be okay to use this value. So we can just go ahead and use our PG is equal to 11 PSF. And that's going to be fine. Again, um, now what would we do if this was over that? Uh, in a location like Portland, what I would do is, I know there, there are uh, Oregon specialty structural codes and there's all sorts of building regulations and special building regulations just for uh, the city limits of Portland for such a large city. Such, such large cities usually have special structure, uh, structural and civil codes. So I would first go there. Um, note, uh, there are, if you're actually designing a building in, in, uh, in Portland, um, do not take these calculations for uh, for a, a given, I am only exploring the provisions in ASC 7. I'm not exploring any of the provisions within um, within the Oregon Special Structural Code or with any provisions in Portland among the Portland Building Code, that sort of thing. So there may be other provisions that apply to where you're building, but I'm looking just at ASC 7. Um, but 
if again, if we had an elevation over, say like we'd have an elevation of 35 feet for this building, I would be looking um, in the Oregon Special Structural Code and also uh, in looking at any kind of or, uh, Portland specific um, regulations to see how to handle this. And if I couldn't find anything, if I lived in a location that just didn't have anything like it, I might just try to find some other similar elevations and make an engineering judgment, maybe do some interpolation. There would be, a, I would probably find something that, um, I could probably, you know, I, I could probably do something like uh, find, a, find a location at a higher elevation and maybe go with that, something nearby, maybe in the hills, maybe a different city nearby that was a higher elevation, and I could use that value, for example. I would just want to find something that I was very, pretty certain that I was, you know, 99% certain um, was going to have uh, deeper snowfall levels than Portland, and I could just use that as a bounding case. So even if I don't know, even if I'm not able to use uh, the value for Portland, I can find a, wor a, a worse case and or a worse case or a worst case or a worse case, a more severe case and go ahead and use that. Okay, so we have that. Um, so we have our PG value. And after that rambling, um, we have our PG value. And our next step is going to be to uh, determine the, uh, the exposure uh, factor. And uh, we'll do that after we clean the board. All right, so we have our ground level snow value. Um, our next step is going to be to determine the exposure factor. So step four is to determine our exposure factor. Uh, determine exposure factor. And this is our CE value. C sub E. And this is found in table um, is 7.3-1. This is found in ASC 7, table 7.3-1. Now, we don't know a lot about the actual location of this building. Um, there are detailed, uh, there are detailed um, criteria for what it means to be sheltered. They're like the, the categories given this table are uh, fully exposed, uh, partially sheltered, and fully sheltered. And uh, we could possibly be able to get away with the partially sheltered case because we don't exactly know the uh, precise number of buildings and their heights and things like that. If we knew more about the topography, the trees around the building, the uh, other buildings around it, I mean, we knew a lot more information beyond this simple example, we could possibly get away with the uh, partially sheltered case, but uh, because um, the, slow, the snow level is actually relatively low at just 11 pounds per square foot, so I think we can just uh, maybe be a little more conservative and just assume the worst case. So I'm just going to go ahead and say from that table, um, I'm going to assume fully sheltered on this. Because this snow load is so small, it's probably not going to be, a, it's very unlikely that's going to be a controlling load case anyway. Um, so I'm just going to go and say, and plus we're, you know, con we're using this building in a highly illegal manner to store uh, weapons grade plutonium for some reason. So, uh, so I'm just going to be conservative and assume a fully sheltered, a fully sheltered building. And what that means is that, um, and again, a, the reason the, the level of shelterness, the expo or level of exposure of a building is important is because that relates to how easily um, snow will pile on a roof. The uh, Generally, the uh, more exposed a building is, the less snow will be able to build on it. Think about it, if you have, um, if you have lots of, imagine a, a building with lots of tall buildings around it, taller buildings around it. Every time snow got in there, blew in there, it would sort of serve as a trap. Like if you have a low area surrounded by high areas, Every time some some snow blows in there, it's just going to tend to pile up because snow might drop down, but it's going to have a very hard time uh, flowing out of there. So the more exposed a building is, the uh, the lower the amount of dr uh, snow drifts that will accumulate on it. So or does the lower amount of snow, whether flat whether a uh, flat roof snow load or um, drifts, will accumulate on it? So it is actually most conservative to assume a fully sheltered condition. Also, we are told the, sur uh, the surface was rough, and without knowing more about it, we can't know exactly what category, but I'm just going to go ahead and assume uh, the roughest category, the roughest surface category. So I'm going to assume um, the roughest category or roughest surface in this table 
which is uh, category B. Which is category B. And these two things together, if we look in that table, um, will produce an exposure factor, CE, equal to 1.2. All right, so next, uh, step five. I'm gonna try to squeeze this down here. So step five, we are going to go and uh, determine the temperature factor. So step five is to determine the temperature factor. Uh, C sub T, the temperature factor. All right, so we need a reference for this, and this temperature factor can be found in table uh, that is 7.3-2. Not surprising, I suppose, right after the exposure factor. So we have our, so um, we're gonna determine the temperature factor, and that table, as we looked at in the previous video, or two videos ago, I suppose, uh, just the introduction to flat roof and monoslope roofs, um, the temperature factor uh, is almost always going to be 1.0, generally unless you have a highly heated building like a green, a heated greenhouse, or you have some a very cold building like a freezer building or something like that. So our building, if you look at the provisions there, doesn't meet any of the um, special temperature classes. So our, our, we just have a normal building, um, well, normal building except for it's storing plutonium, but, uh, and I suppose you could argue that the, uh, that would heat the building up if it's giving off a lot of uh, decay radiation and such. But to be conservative, we can ignore that and just say that CT is equal to 1.0. We have our temperature factor. All right, so step six is we're going to calculate P sub F, our uh, snow load, our, our flat roof snow load. So step six is uh, calculate and this is just that side drawing, a piece of F, the flat roof snow load. Again, this, this is kind of what's on the tin. Um, or, or, or as a bit of a review, the ground level snow load, the PG, that is what's applied just to a flat empty field. That's what we expect in this location. If there were no buildings present, there was nothing but just dirt or grass or gravel there or something. And that's PG, the ground level snow load. PF is what we expect on a building of this surface roughness at this kind of exposure um, uh, on a flat roof. Okay, so we're gonna calculate that. And we do that from equation, not table, but equation 7.3-1. And we can, uh, the equation is as follows, as we saw in the previous video, that's a lowercase p, pf equals 0 0.7 um, times ce, ct, our exposure category, ce, our temperature factor, ct, actually exposure, I should say exposure, uh, uh, exposure factor, um, or exposure constant, ce, our temperature factor, ct, IS, our snow load importance factor, which we already determined, and then finally multiplied by PG, the uh, ground level snow load, and putting in the appropriate numbers, we get that uh, we'll have 0 0.7, the constant, times our CE value of 1.2. Again, we're assuming a worst case in that one. Uh, CT, we just have a normal building temperature wise, um, so we ha we'll have a CT of 1.0. IS, we are storing weapons grade plutonium. So this can never be let out. And again, for some reason we care about uh, ASC regulations but we, or ASC provisions, but for some reason we don't care about any NRC regulations. So <laughs> we have a rather bizarre building here. But yes, our importance factor is going to be the, the, uh, the highest one because we're designing something that absolutely has to contain this plutonium no matter what. So we have one point, an importance factor of 1.2 and our PG value our ground level uh, snow value is 11 PSF, as we previously determined. And if you go and multiply all that out, well, it turns out that the factors actually just kind of cancel each other out, and we're left with 11.1 um, PSF. And that is our flat roof snow load. That is our flat roof snow load. Okay, 
So there is that. And then um, step seven. If you remember, if you remember back to some to this one part of um, our introduction to snow loading, there was a minimum value for flat roof snow loads, and this applies to any regular roofs that are uh, less than 15 degrees in slope, and a flat roof definitely is. So uh, we need to check the flat roof snow load, or not the flat roof snow load, sorry, the minimum um, uh, shallow slope roof um, snow load. So we're going to check um, check a minimum low, uh, low slope. The minimum low slope uh, roof snow load. ASC 7 says, regardless of what the calculations show, if you have a flat, uh, have, have, or not a flat roof, if you have a roof of a very shallow slope, we're going to make sure, regardless of what the calculations say, that you design it at least for some minimum value. And the reason for that is that a flat roof will just naturally tend to accumulate certain snow. If you have a very steep roof, well, then snow will just tend to slide right off it, but a flat roof will always end up gathering some snow. So even if your climatic conditions say that it's very unlikely for a deep snow to occur, they still put a minimum, slap a minimum value on this and said, look, if you're building a, fa a flat roof building, at least design it for some minimum snow load. And this is, um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, we first need to check if it applies. We have two uh, methods of, we have two things we need to do on this. One, does it apply? And to determine if it applies, we say is the, we ask if the ground level snow load is PG less than or equal to 20 PSF. And based on this check, if it's less than or greater than, we have different uh, provisions, different equations to determine the minimum snow load. And this is 11, and that's less than 20. So yes, we do have some value we need to apply. And the equation that this that it gives you if you're less than or equal to 20 PSF is that our minimum uh, flat roof snow load is going to be IS times PG IS times PG, which is uh, 1.2, uh, 1 1.2, our importance factor, times our ground level snow load of 11 PSF, and that comes to 13.2 uh, PSF, and then you want to just go and check to make sure that that is greater than your flat roof, your previously calculated flat roof snow load, and which was 11.1 .1 PSF. So what do we do with this value? We calculate, we just determined that, uh, because, okay, again, as a bit of review, what we did here was we first determined which regime of the minimum snow load we were under, or the minimum shallow roof, the minimum shallow roof snow load we're under. And because our PG is less than or equal to 20, our minimum flat roof snow load is calculated by this equation here. There's a different equation if you're over 20, and we went over that in that previous video. Now, um, so we got that value, we determined it was 13.2, uh, which was 1.2 times 11, that's 13.2. That is, and we did check to make sure that that was actually greater than our, um, than our, uh, flat roof snow load that we previously calculated here. Okay, so we have these two things. We have the calculated flat roof snow load, and then we have the minimum flat roof snow load. Now, this is actually pretty interesting. If you act, well, According to certain people, according to me, I think it's interesting. Um, this is this minimum value is a load case unto itself. So um, you don't actually have to use the minimum value, uh, use this code minimum value when calculating drift loads and such, but you do have to actually apply that to the entire roof and um, run a load case with that applied. And so you have you're going to have to, uh, regardless you're going to have to whether okay. Um, so basically you have to apply the minimum uh, flat roof snow load to your roof um, if your slope is under 15 degrees. Um, however, when um, doing all the drift calculations that come later, you don't actually have to use this minimum value. Um, you're only required to use the value that you actually previously calculated. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother asking you to calculate this. They would just ask you to calculate the minimum one, although I suppose you could be over than that wouldn't apply. But um, anyway, um, so we could actually get away by only applying the drift calculation with the 11.1 .1 PSF. That would be perfectly fine. Um, however, because, you know, uh, because this is such a light snow load anyway, 
I'm just going to go ahead and use 13.2 PSF um, as my flat roof snow load. I'm just going to adopt the minimum as, uh, um, as, the, as the flat roof snow load. You don't have to do that. That is entirely optional. I'm just doing that to be extra conservative because for some reason we're designing a plutonium storage facility in downtown Portland. Okay, so again, as a review, um, you, for the minimum uh, flat roof snow load provision, you first um, check which regime you're in, which equation you're in. We found that we were less than the value of what less than the critical value of 20 for our uh, we found that our ground level snow load was less than our critical value of 20. And so therefore this equation, the ISPG applied. And then calculating that we got 13.2, which in fact is greater than our 11.1. If our if our calculated flat roof snow load value was like say 15, this number would never be seen again. We could just use the 15, we would just use the 15. We would never use this one again. However, because this is in fact greater, um, if we didn't want to do any drift calculations for some reason, uh, we would have to do a check of this one. And in our drift calculations, we don't actually have to do the, we don't have to use this higher value, the 13.2. We are allowed to use just the 11.1, .1, but to be conservative, I'm going to use the 13.2 value. All right, hopefully that's clear as mud. Um, I know that was quite a lot to say something relatively simple. And so let's move on and to do that, we will clear the board. All right, so the board is clear and uh, let's just, let's continue. So um, again, as a reminder, our uh, PF, our flat roof snow load was 11.1 .1 PSF. Our uh, flat roof minimum, our flat roof minimum was 13.2. We could just apply this one to the flat roof and just run that case and not never use that number again. But I've decided to go ahead and adopt this value as my uh, flat roof uh, snow load of 13.2 pounds per square foot. So this is my new flat roof snow load. I'm being a little conservative and just using the minimum value even for the drift calculations, though technically you don't actually need to do this. Um, you can always go more, con more conservative if you want. Uh, you can't just use a, a, a smaller value if you want, but if you want to be more conservative, you always are allowed, of course, to do that. Okay, so we have now completed all of our initial calculations of flat roof snow load. So that's really uh, one of the first things we were asked to find. And that really is one of the core solutions that we wanted. So we have our flat roof snow load, and now we want to investigate the drift conditions. So the next step, so what I'm gonna label step eight in our many, many step process, is going to be to compute the specific gravity, or as the ASCE so crudely labels density, which is certainly more of a specific gravity than the density. Um, but, uh, I'm going to predict, I'm going to calculate our predicted snow specific gravity uh, in our snow drifts and actually in our flat snow, uh, flat roof snow as well, just our level uh, flat roof snow as well. Uh, snow specific gravity. In other words, our gamma and our gamma the equation given for that is zero point, and this is again just an empirical equation based on research. You can't just derive this from base principles. Um, we have gamma equals 0.13 pg uh, plus 14, and this must be less than or equal to 30 pounds per cubic foot. We have an upper limit of 30 pounds per cubic foot. Um, so, uh, and in terms of units, of course, we use we just use our PG of pounds per square foot, and this will output a value of uh, pounds per square foot. So we have 0 0.13, and I'm going to use our value of 13.2 here. 13.2 plus 14, and this will then come to uh, gamma equals to 15.7 uh, pounds per cubic foot. So again, what ASC7 labels as a density, but if you really want to be technical in terms of fluid mechanics, this would be a specific weight. Um, oh my goodness, wow. 
I am lecturing people on wrong label, on correct labels. The <laughs> specific gravity, no specific weight. Wow. Maybe that's just why they call it. Maybe that's why they label it density. I'm calling it specific gravity. No, it's specific weight. If I ever refer to specific gravity on this, it should be specific weight, not specific gravity. Oh well, maybe that's that's probably why they call it densities to avoid that uh, tongue tying. Okay, so we have our specific weight, which is 15.7 pounds per cubic foot. In other words, for all of our calculations, we're going to assume that a cubic foot of the snow, um, which again, as we've explored, can have wildly different densities. We're going to assume that a cubic foot of it will weigh uh, 15.7 pounds. Next, um, I want to determine HB. This is, so we've completed step eight, and then we moved on to step nine, which is determine, to determine HB, the balanced snow load depth. That's what the B stands for. And as a reminder why it's referred to as the balanced snow load when I'm previously using this flat roof value, is the, the balanced value is made to be in contrast to a unbalanced value. Like if you have a, if you have roofs with co more complex geometries, you won't just have a single um, a single flat roof, for example, or a single monoslope roof. You will have uh, there are unbalanced load cases you need to consider. Uh, that's not covered in the scope of this uh, series right now. Uh, there again, there are many provisions than I see. I'm just trying to give you a basic overview of some of the provisions and. Um, but for now, just realize that in the case of a flat roof, the balanced snow load will be equal to the flat roof snow load. Um, if you have a simple flat roof building, you don't need to consider the unbalanced uh, load cases usually, although there may be some strange exceptions. Um, so we need to determine this HB, the balanced snow load depth. And this is HB equals, and the formula for this, this isn't just, this isn't given in the um, provisions anywhere, but this can be just determined or derived, and that's just going to be PF. Um, this is just from basic uh, first principles. If you have the specific weight of something and you want the depth, just divide, or if you have the um, pressure pounds per square foot of something and you want to know its depth, just divide the pounds per square foot by the density. Um, and we did explore this in the previous video. And if you want to, and we divide, so in this case, we divide by the specific weight, which is gamma. So HB is equal to PF, our flat roof snow load, divided by gamma, our specific weight, and the units will work out nicely. We're gonna get 13.2 um, pounds per square foot divided by our uh, specific weight of 15.7 pounds per cubic foot. And that comes to a value of 0 0.84 feet. So we have a depth of 0 0.84 feet. So less than one foot. So what is that? Maybe 10 inches or so, maybe a little over 10 inches. Um, so a little over 10 inches, 0 0.84 feet. Then, uh, so we have our HB, our balanced snow load depth. Then we want to determine HC, which you remember from the previous video was the distance from the upper level of the balanced or flat roof snow load up to the upper roof. And since the distance between the upper roof and the lower roof in our original given diagram was five feet, the HC value is going to be five feet minus 0 0.84 feet. In other words, we have the two roofs. These are separated by a height of five feet. We have our balanced snow load, which is HB and that equals our 0 0.84 feet. So then, it, and so HC is this distance here. It's sort of the clear distance above the balanced snow load um, to the upper roof. And that then comes to, if you do the subtraction, that comes to zero, or sorry, 4.16 feet. So we have our HC value, that is 4.16 feet. And next we're going to uh, determine if drift calculations are necessary. But to do that, we're going to, you know what? You know what we're gonna have to do? We're gonna have to clear the board. All right, so we've determined our HC value. Um, we now know the uh, HB and the HC values. So our next step is going to be to, determ is going to, be to determine if uh, we need to actually consider drifting in this, uh, uh, in this uh, building uh, example. Step 11 is going to be determine 
if drift calculations are necessary. If we just had a single flat roof across the entire building, we would know that we didn't have to do that because you only have to consider drifting when you have um, when you have roofs of two different heights. But um, although that occurs in more buildings than you think, because you also have to consider this in cases of things like parapet walls, which are usually in most commercial buildings and uh, commercial buildings, industrial buildings, that sort of thing, educational buildings, they're very common. Uh, parapet walls, if you're not familiar, are just the um, slight three to four foot high walls on the roofs of buildings that uh, just exist to hide machinery and stuff from the ground. So you don't have to look at all the machinery um, on the roof of a building when you're walking up to it. Just, they're just for aesthetic purposes primarily. Um, but if you think about that, if you have a parapet wall, it can then cause uh, snow drifting along. Um, it can cause snow drifting uh, because it's, it's effectively another roof, although a very short one or very uh, narrow one, I should say. Okay, so um, we're going to determine this. And the equation that we need to check is HC over HB. We need to check the ratio of this and see if this is less than 0 0.2. And um, as long as the, so we will, we will have to do this unless we are less than 0 0.2. And let's go ahead and do this. HC is 4.16 and uh, the HB is 0 0.84 feet. And this then comes to 4.95, uh, 4 not 4.95 feet, but just a ratio of 4.95. And that is much, much greater than 0 0.2. So we are nowhere close to being able to ignore drift calculations. So therefore a check, um, a drift check is needed or drift calcs are needed. So you need to check if your HB, check the ratio of your HB and HC values. And if the ratio is, uh, as long as the ratio is greater than 0.2, uh, you're going to need to do the drift calculations. Okay, because basically with that, if we were, if you remember from the previous video, basically the only time that won't occur is if you have like a roof and your, if you have a two, if you have two different roof heights and your flat roof snow load is almost to the top of the upper roof. And so, That'll only generally occur if you are in an area with uh, very, very high snow loads, very deep snow loads, or if you're in, an, if you or if your roof just has um, two different heights that are so close together, you could probably just consider them uh, a single uh, elevation anyway. So it is confirmed that we do need to consider um, that we do actually need to consider uh, drift calculations. And so. Um, now the next step, I, I'm going to be need both boards for, so I think I'm going to clear the board again. All right, so we've determined that we do need to run through the drift calculations, and so step 12, we're already on step 12, if you can believe it, is to determine the drift height. So we want to determine the drift height, and if you recall from the previous lecture, uh, we saw that there were two cases we need to consider. We need to consider both the um, the windward case and the leeward case. So let's first consider the leeward case. Um, so the leeward case. So our leeward case. I'll try to work through on this board, and uh, we can use a uh, figure seven point six dash one in ASC seven. Or we can use the equation that is described uh, below it. And so I'm just going, I like the equation. I tend to like the, to using the equations more than using the charts, especially when I'm working on a board like this. So that's what I'm going to do. So the equation, uh, and we're looking for HD, the height, the maximum height or maximum depth of the uh, drift surcharge. And that's going to be equal to uh, 0.43. So 0 0.43 times the cubic root of L sub u. And as a review, as a reminder, L sub u is the length of the upper wall um, for the leeward case, anyway. And then um, we have times the uh, fourth root of pg plus 10. Uh, the fourth root of pg plus 10 
uh, close parentheses, and then minus 10. Close brackets. And all of this times uh, the square root of the snow importance factor. Isn't that lovely? So 0.43 times, so um, a set of parentheses times each other, 0.43 times the cubic root of LU times the fourth root of the quantity PG plus 10, where PG is our ground level snow load, and then um, minus 10, and all of that times the square root of IS, or our snow importance factor. So plugging in the numbers that we have, this is going to be just the same 0 0.43 uh, times the cubic root, uh, the cubic root of 80, that's the length of the upper, uh, that is the length of the upper roof um, beyond the intersection point, or the intersection line, the wall essentially, uh, times the fourth root of our uh, PG. Again, here we're using the ground snow load, our PG, not the uh, flat roof snow load. That, that's just what appears in this equation. That is 11 uh, plus our 10, our constant of 10. Oh, and in terms of units, this is another one of those wacky empirical equations that you can't derive from uh, base principles. Instead, you just have to put in the values that it, in the units it expects. Um, PG is, again, expected in um, pounds per square foot, and LU is expected in um, in feet, and then IS is just a unitless number. Okay, and then minus 1.5, close bracket, and times the square root of our importance factor, which because we're des designing a horrible plutonium warehouse, is uh, the square root of 1.2, again, 1.2 being the most, at uh, the highest, most critical um, importance factor. And if I did the math correctly, I get an HD value, the, again, the peak height of the uh, discharge or the surcharge at 2.70 feet. 2.70 feet. So that is the, the drift surcharge. Okay. Now there is one check we have to run on this case. We need, and this is really just for the, the case of very narrow um, walls. And we need to check if um, HD is less than or equal to 0 0.6 times LU. Is it? That's what we need to find out. And we, sh we say that 2.70, oh, I'm running through the numbers, this shouldn't surprise you, 0 0.6 times 80, times 80 feet, well that just comes to 48 feet, so we're fine, because 2.70 feet is much less Jack Mabel replaced that with a less than sign. Just to be clear, we are much less than 48 feet, so we are good. Also, um, there's this reminds me of something I haven't mentioned yet, I don't believe, maybe in the previous video. Okay, so I mentioned just a bit ago that we have that there are cases where you deal with um there are cases you would deal with uh, uh boundary walls and things like that. Parapet walls is the word I'm looking for. And so that's again where you have a roof surrounded by a very narrow um, raised roof. And at first that might seem, wait a minute, if you th if the, that wall might only be a foot across, does that mean the maximum drift is on the maximum drift height you would use is only 0.6 times a foot across? No. And the reason for that is that if you look in the uh, provisions of AC7, it says that if your LU, your L sub U, the length of that upper wall is less than 20 feet that you actually use that 20 foot value. So the minimum value, I didn't address it here, probably should have been another check, but LU min that you're allowed to use, I believe is just 20 foot. Although don't quote me on that, you might want to double check that for your reference. Okay, so there is that. So we have determined the value of this, uh, min of this drift height based on, oh, and again, it also, one other thing, if we were over the 48 feet, we would just use the 48 foot value um, for our uh, drift height. That would be an exceptionally tall drift. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, next, um, I want to look at the windward case, which is going to be very similar, with only a few variables changed. So the windward case says um, we use uh, we substitute 
the uh, lower roof dimension length for the uh, upper roof dimension. So in this case, we substitute uh, 60 feet into L naught or LU. So if you run through those calculations, um, so again, we're going to use the same, uh, use same IS value, the importance factor value, and the same uh, ground level snow load, PG. But if you put 60 feet into LU, into this equation here, into the equation that's found in the figure 7.6-1, if I did the math correctly on that, you will, by just direct substitution, uh, and just the exact same calculation, this, basically this exact same calculation, except putting 60 in here instead of 80. That looks like a, that looks like a 8.0, well, that's 80. So if you run this same equation, except using the cube root of 60 rather than the cube root of 80, I get an HD value of 2.30 feet, assuming I made no math errors, which is certainly possible. Okay, then there is one other thing you have to do for the windward case, and that is you have to reduce it by 25%. So now, reduce by 25%. And uh, we get HD for the windward case is equal to 1.73 feet. So 1.73 feet and 2.70 feet. Now, again, this does not mean that we apply this. Uh, to, now, if you remember from the previous video, this doesn't mean that we apply a 2.70 uh, deep surcharge to one side of the building and then 1.73 to the other. This is essentially comparing the same location on the building but looking at wind coming from two different directions because wind can come from any direction. And so you do need to consider what happens if the wind is coming from the opposite direction. So what we do is we simply run through the calculation, determine which one, it, you know, calculate uh, what uh, drift height would be produced, what drift surcharge height would be produced if, our, uh, if we were looking at a leeward case. We did that and we found it was 2.70 feet. Then we reverse the wind and see that it uh, that in the windward case we would have a drift surcharge height of 1.73 uh, feet, and then all we have to do is figure out which one is bigger. And well, I may not be the smartest person in the world, but I am pretty sure 2.70 is a bigger number than 1.73 feet. So this then becomes our design HD value. We now have the depth of our uh, drift surcharge, which again is the depth beyond what, the, it is the maximum depth beyond uh, what we have in the flat roof case. Now, all we really, the only quantity we still need to figure out um, is really the, uh, the real last determining thing is really we just need to figure out the width of this triangular load. And then um, we can uh, figure out and plot out the, our entire uh, load situation. And we will do that by clearing the board. All right, so we're getting toward the end, thankfully. And our step 13 is going to be to determine our drift width. So step 13, determine our drift width. A bit of a tongue teaser or a tongue twister. Determine our drift width. In other words, W. Which again, ASC7 uses the variable W. And so we need a couple of things. We know that HC, again, the distance from the top of the uh, flat roof snow load to the upper roof, we know that is 4.16 feet. And we know our worst case depth that is going to control is HD, our, our depth of our snow surcharge drift is 2.70 feet. And uh, depending on which of these is larger, there are two different regimes when determining um, what W, the value of W is. And we are in the case where HD is less than or equal to HC. And that's where you're going to be probably 90% of the time, if not more. So therefore, W, the width of our uh, drift, is just uh, 4 uh, HD, 4 times HD. And that's going to be 4 times 2.70 feet, um, which is equal to 10.81 feet. Now, it does ask us to compare the uh, 
to compare the uh, this width value w to the length of our um, lower roof, and that length is 60 feet, and so we are well less than that, so we're good there. As a reminder, if we found out, like if we had gotten w equals 70 feet, then what we would do is we would draw a, uh, instead of uh, drawing a triangle from uh, the HD depth uh, down to the uh, snow depth, um, terminating at 10.81 feet, we would just terminate it at 60 feet instead. Okay, so there's that. And then um, step 14, I want to um, determine the peak uh, snow load surcharge. I just want to get a load value for it. Um, let's see, so determine, this is just going to be a simple multiplication. I just want to get a numerical value for it. Uh, determine peak snow surcharge load. Oh, that is not how you spell snow. Uh, peak snow surcharge load. And that is P sub D, and that is equal to gamma, our specific weight, times HD, which is our surcharge depth, and that is 15.7 pounds per cubic foot, our specific weight, times our height of 2.70 feet, and I get a value of 42.4 uh, pounds per square foot. And finally, our last step for this video, for this lecture, I just want to go, I'm not doing any more calculations, I just want to plot out what all of this means so we can get some visualization for it. I want to plot out the loads. I want to create some load maps, basically. So, um, we have our upper roof and our lower roof. This dimension, again, was, I believe, 80 feet. And this was 60 feet. And um, I'm just going to plot out the loads. I'm not going to plot out all the dimensions, but I'm going to plot out some critical ones. In terms of the loads, now realize that we have the drifts, but the flat roof snow load still applies everywhere. And I chose to just use the value of the minimum. Um, even though I probably could, um, well, actually, we'd have to use the, we could have applied the minimum as just its own load case uniform throughout, but I just I chose to adopt it uh, as a, a just to be a little bit more conservative. So we have this PF is 13.2 uh, PSF. Uh, this is going to be applied across the entire upper roof. And this flat roof snow load uniform load is also going to be applied on the lower roof. Um, as a constant load, the same 13.2 PSF. And this is a pounds per square foot. And then we have a surcharge, which is the, the load from the uh, snowdrift that we calculated. And this is going to have a peak value here of um, this distance, the total difference. This is the difference in, in load, not the absolute value, the, di the distance or the difference there, our PD, is equal to 42.4 uh, uh, pounds per square foot. And uh, I should probably also, because in order to do the statics on this, you would need to include the actual uh, wi uh, total width of that. And as we determined, the width of that was um, 10.81 feet. Assuming we know, made no mathematical errors, which is certainly possible. Now, I would like to uh, show what this would look like as line loads as well. We could also interpret this as line loads, because again, these are area loads. They're going to be applied across the entire uh, width or depth into the board, for example. And so if I were to then, now, if you remember from the initial drawing, I mentioned briefly that we, could, we were going to assume that this thing, went off, that this building uh, had a constant cross section just all the, just a hundred feet into the page. So the dimension into the page is a hundred feet. So if I want to get the total, if I just want to get some line loads on this building, it would look as follows. Let me just replot out the uh, let me replot out the building shape. So I interpret this as line loads. So again, these are area loads. If I reinterpret this as line loads, 
I will get something like this. Um, actually, I might give myself a little more room to work here. A little more height for our load. Uh, okay, so it's something like this. Our upper roof and our lower roof. And for the uh, upper roof, it's going to be relatively simple. All we have to do is multiply the 13.2 PSF times 100 feet into the board. So we get a total line load of 1.32 kips per foot. Kip being a thousand pounds. So 1.32 kips per foot. And I'm going to go ahead and combine the two, uh, these two, uh, the, the, um, uh, for the maximum load here, right at the uh, wall, I'm going to combine the 13.2 PSF with the maximum value of 42.4 PSF. In fact, I might even give myself a little more room to work here so I can create a little bit more clearer diagram, as clear as these things go anyway, when I'm drawing them. So let's see, where is that? I'm going to really exaggerate this to give myself plenty of vertical space to work with. And so we're going to have, for the uh, flat roof load portion, we have the same load of 1.32 kips per foot, but adding these two PSF values, the 13.2 and the 42.4, and then multiplying by the, uh, the 100 feet depth, I get an upper, I'll have an upper value here, and this value will be, that comes to 5.56 kips per foot. And then we could draw this as a series of distributed line loads, or as a distributed line load. And since I am, since I have this transition point between the two loads, I definitely want to put a dimension in there, which is that same W that we previously have used, which is 10.8 feet. And that is the example. So as a review, what have we done? Well, we have gone and uh, we started with an exam with a building. It was a flat roof building with two with a lower and an upper roof. We went and calculated the. Uh, we first determined the importance factor. We determined um, its risk category. Uh, we then went and ran through the calculations of the flat roof snow load um, and ended up adopting the minimum value to be conservative. Not that we we you always have to apply the minimum value as its own load case. But we applied it, we chose to be conservative and just ad adopt it for our uh, drift calculations as well. We determined if we needed to do drift calculations, then we ran through all the drift calculations, uh, finally uh, culminating in a set of uh, area loads, which can also be interpreted as a set of line loads. All right, that was quite a lot. So we went through quite a lot this evening. Hopefully you uh, learned a little bit here and there about snow loads. Uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have them. I guess that'll do it for now. Um, again, hopefully you found this a little bit illuminating or, uh, I don't know, a little bit entertaining, not entertaining, hopefully not, uh, but uh, as for the record, please don't uh, build any plutonium warehouses in downtown Portland, um, or please don't report me to the NRC because I am not actually planning on building a plutonium warehouse in downtown Portland. Anyway, that'll do it for now. Again, let me know if you have any questions. I will see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.